She has a genius IQ. She has a master's in marine biology. She speaks seven languages. She's a psychic. She is an articulate champion of animal rights and the ecology. But most people know her as the queen of low-budget horror movies. The reason she got into films was because she's a hot girl. And people like hot girls, and hot girls get to do a lot of cool stuff. You can't be in 100 movies if you're not any good. If I see a, a, a low-budget horror movie on TV and she's not in it, I call her up and say, are you all right? Were you, were you sick that day? When she's on the screen, you're interested in what she's doing. And when she's threatened, you worry about it. It's really easy to be famous in a B-movie because you took your top off. Whatever, get out. But Brink doesn't need to do that. Are you some sort of lesbian? Get out. My mistake. She is the queen of all media. When it comes to this subculture that we earn our living in. To just be working with her once was incredible. Now I'm gonna have her in every one of our little films until she gets a restraining order on us. I promise you this will not go unanswered. She became an icon in the business because that was what her intent was. She's driven with a capital D. You don't have to just act, you can do all of this. She's seen it all, she's done it all, she knows it all. She really opened the door for us. She's honest and smart and dead on. She's also a great cook. She's who you want on your team. She's self-winding. She works and plays well with others. It's like saying, well, I, I met Groucho. You don't have to tell them who it is. It's that one name recognition. She's like Coca-Cola. She is the brand. means sales. I have a quick time of it somewhere. There's an instant fan recognition. That's not enough. But of course, she didn't start out as Brink Stevens. She created Brink Stevens, and she became Brink Stevens. But when she was born, September 20th, 1954, her parents called her Charlene Brinkman. I grew up in a small, small town outside of San Diego, California. About 400 people lived there. It was called Crest, up at the top of a mountain. And it was very rural. Everybody had uh, horses and chickens and all that. Great place to grow up. We had a lot of property, wilderness around, and I could just let my imagination run wild as a kid. From the beginning, she was a little different. My heritage is German, and almost everybody in my family is six foot two, blonde and blue eyed. I always felt like I'd been dropped off by aliens, and sooner or later they would inevitably return for me. I remember when I was about five years old, my mother took me into a used bookstore, and they had this bin of old pulp magazines for five cents. And I picked one up, and on the cover was this merman with gills and fins and all that. And I'm like, woo, what's this? And I begged her to buy it for me, and I was hooked. I knew that I wanted to be a biologist, but at that time, I was thinking I wanted to be an astrobiologist, a woman astronaut who would land on another planet and observe, analyze, possibly communicate with alien life forms. But it became pretty clear by ninth or 10th grade that the space program was not keeping up with my own ambitions. So I switched my focus to the last unexplored frontier, which was the oceans. And dolphins are kind of an alien species. So I decided I was going to be the first person to communicate with dolphins. The fondness for marine biology led her to Scripps uh, Institute down in San Diego. I said, well, I have an idea what I want to do. I want to do communication experiments with dolphins. And their faces blanched white, and this look of horror in their eyes, and they're like, no, absolutely not. 
And I'm like, why? I've got it all figured out. And they're going to know. You don't understand. Scripps Institute is at the mercy of funding from outside sources. Their research is primarily funded by things like the tuna industry. Which is killing a thousand dolphins a day in their tuna nets. And the CIA and the U.S. Navy. Which is doing experiments with dolphins, strapping bombs on their backs to blow up submarines, and the dolphin too. If you could determine that dolphins could actually communicate with you, you almost have to acknowledge that they have a soul. And then you would have to feel really guilty about slaughtering them. So pick something else. I'm like, well, what? And they said, guppies. Pick guppies. Guppies are safe. <laughs> so needless to say, I wasn't really interested in fish. It's hard to communicate with a fish. <laughs> Mammals are so much more interesting. So I got permission to do my doctoral thesis on vision in seals. And I have to admit, nobody really cared about vision in seals. Uh, it was just a way to stay in school. About two years into my career at Scripps, I took a volunteer job at SeaWorld, working behind the scenes in the research part of it. I was compiling a library on the bottlenose dolphin. Somehow, word got back to Scripps, and I got called on the carpet, where the first thing they said to me was, you can't stay here any longer. I said, excuse me, what? And they said, it would have been safer if you'd stuck with guppies. Money has no guts. Pew, she's out of there. So uh, career as a scientist, sk done. It was the singular most devastating thing that ever happened to me in my life. While in college, she became a member of the comic book club and began attending the now legendary San Diego Comic Con. And this was back when it was easier to find a mint condition copy of Batman number one at one of those than it was to find an attractive woman. Over the past 30 years, the Comic Con has become a celebration of pop culture. There are celebrities and panel discussions and costume contests. My big uh, masquerade debut was when I was 19 years old in 1973. I went on stage as Vampirella and I came out in this black cape and the music was playing and I whipped it off and I had this little next to nothing costume on and the crowd went wild. So it was the first time that I had ever displayed myself on stage and gotten that kind of response. It was truly a life-changing moment. The dance was supposed to be exotic. Corey Ackerman was one of the judges. But Brink made it erotic. I won first place. Uh, it started a great friendship with Forey that's continued to the present day. He's been like my godfather. The first movie I ever got was because the filmmaker saw my picture as Vampirella at Forey's house. That first movie was directed by filmmaker and photographer Dan Golden. I was at Forey Ackerman's house, and he had a picture of Brink on the wall. And I said, I think she'd be great for this film I'm about to shoot. And he got me in touch with her, and she was in the film. is history, I guess. In the College Comic Club, she also met artist Dave Stevens. And Dave had this idea for a comic book, an epic adventure set just before the Second World War. He called it The Rocketeer. I would pose for the early comic books, t-shirts, model kits, and so on, and it would be my body and Betty's face. Betty Page wasn't around anymore, but there was her face, and she was like, you know, sort of the entry-level Betty Page for a lot of us. The t-shirts, there's one where Betty is over the Rocketeer's shoulder. We shot it with me leaning over the back of a sofa, and that look on my face is like, hurry up and get the shot. <laughs> she was Betty when it counted. I think Dave couldn't have drawn her the way he did. He couldn't have done the things he did without having known that spark, that fire that was her, that everything that was sweet and wonderful, yet knowing and ambitious. But Charlene's ambition still ran to science. She took a job in San Diego doing an environmental impact study on Santa Corn Nuclear Power Plant. This was supposed to be a five-year program, and after a year and a half, the grant money ran out. When that grant ran out, I didn't know what I was going to do, and at that point, I got a marriage proposal from Dave. He had just moved to Los Angeles. It was 1980. We were married. And unfortunately, even though we dated for six years, it was a very short-lived union. It was over after about six months. She said, well, he gave me a great last name. I suddenly found myself in Los Angeles, again, not knowing what I was going to do. And this divorce was the second most devastating thing. But it changed my life. It turned everything around. 
I changed my name from Charlene Brinkman to Brink Stevens. I changed my voice. I changed my handwriting. It's as if I went through a complete transformation and became a whole different person. Boy, that takes a lot of courage. Um, it's very difficult to be a leopard and change your spots. I continued to model for Dave uh, after we got divorced for about another six years. So I invested about 12 years into working with him, being his muse. The issues of Rocketeer, which came out during the time I knew Dave and during the time we were married, were in some ways so much a reflection of our life together. Gee, the Rocketeer guy looked a lot like Dave, and the heroine in the comic book looked like this amazing cross between Brink Stevens and Betty Page, and the evil Marco of Hollywood looked just like me. Ken Marcus was a photographer for Playboy. After the dissolution of her marriage to Dave Stevens, he and Brink started seeing each other. This apparently did not please Dave. And there's a scene where Betty goes to do a modeling assignment with Marco of Hollywood. The true-hearted, small-town boy loses his girlfriend to the evil glamour photographer in the big city. The goons burst in, and Betty's there naked on a dais. And you cut back to the racketeer, who's like, ha-ha, serves her right. So I think that uh, for Dave, it was sort of a way to vent. Brink was one of Ken's favorite subjects, and in turn, he helped her become a professional model. If you just go online and go into Google and type in the word Brink Stevens and see what pops up, lots and lots of my pictures are there. He taught me everything about modeling, holding poses. In the long run, Hefner, as did Bob Guccini at Penthouse, they both said the same thing. Her breasts are too small to be a centerfold. She's very aware of where the camera is, and she plays it. She does it in a, in a way that there's a subtlety to it that you don't think she's hamming it up or posing, but she just knows where it is and where she needs to look and what she needs to do, and she looks great doing it. Some people that come through here, they need some yanking around to get to where I want to take them, which is I want to find their dark side, and I want to show that because it's part of everyone. I'm no good at the pinup look. Bring knows that. And while her dark side is sort of a classy dark side, she just knows how to hit it. You know, I don't have to tell her what to do. I don't have to say, give me attitude, because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for attitude. I want to I want to see your anger, man, you know? And um, Brink has a little attitude that she can throw out there. Through Ken Marcus, Brink met actress and model Christina Engelhardt. For a couple of years there, the three of us were pretty much joined at the hip. We all became like a great family of friends. We did wonderful things together. It was a great time. We did a lot of projects together, a lot of photo shoots, both with Ken. We also worked, uh, did for magazines, photo review. She who has the Betty Page look would be the dominatrix, and I would be the victim. We're fearless together. So in fearlessness, you know, there's no, there's really no more naughty. And through Christina, Brink met Italian director Federico Fellini. It was such an honor to be in the man's presence and to spend as much time with him as I did. People kind of roll their eyes up with, oh yeah, you and Federico Fellini, oh yeah, sure. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, they brought Fellini to my studio one day. Not that I was here, I happened to be out of town that day, which really killed me. When he went back to Italy, Federico Fellini designed a comic graphic novel and I helped him with it. And I'm actually on the cover of the book. And he used images of Brink as part of the episode. Later, he took some of the experiences of the week that we'd all shared in Los Angeles and put them into a movie called Voce de la Luna, Voices of the Moon. But knowing Fellini doesn't pay the rent. Brink spent time pounding the pavement looking for modeling gigs. I had set up an appointment one day, one afternoon, like 4 o'clock. So I go in with my portfolio, and the secretary's like, oh, I'm sorry, they forgot about your appointment. They're gone for the day. So I'm trudging down the hallway with my portfolio, and there's an open door. And then there's all these colorful movie posters on the wall. So I kind of slow down, and I'm looking in, and I don't realize there's a guy sitting behind a desk watching me. And all of a sudden, he speaks up, and he's like, you! You with the portfolio, come here. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm in the wrong place. He goes, no, come here, show me what you got. So I walk in, and he looks at my portfolio, and he says, uh, you want to be in a movie tomorrow? And I'm like, uh, 
yeah, okay, sure. I, I was an extra in all the marbles. It was like $40 a day in lunch. A lot of women get into the business because they want to do it and they think it's so cool and they want to be a bee queen. Brink just sort of fell into it. But I thought, this is fun. This beats um, being a secretary, a temp, until I can find a science job. So I continue to do extra work with this casting agency. I've probably been an extra in about 100 movies and TV shows, and this really supported me. And then came Roger Corman's slasher epic, Slumber Party Massacre. I saw the ad in Drama Log. They needed a lot of pretty girls to scream and die horribly. And it set the template for the rest of my career. Unfortunately, she gets killed too early, but but I love her performance in that. I kept waiting for somebody to come along and say, you, you're not a real actress, get out of here. But nobody did. Then, at that time, it was before video, I saw the movie on the big screen in a theater, and I'm like, wow. I've never aspired to be an actor, and I haven't really taken acting classes. I've learned on the fly. The um, driller killer, Michael Valella, would sit there rubbing his drill with Vaseline. I'm like, what is he doing? And they're like, eh, it's method, you know? <laughs> she learned her chops um, on the set from whatever director she was working with, from whatever script she was working on. It just comes from somewhere inside. She has that quality as an actress that you want to follow her across the screen. God help you. No matter what the character is that she plays, whether she's a victim or she is the one inflicting the, the pain, she has a certain humanity to her that makes the audience identify with her. You only think of yourself, you slut. In Horror Vision, she was like this goth photographer, you know, and uh, in uh, Witch House 3, she plays a, a witch. You know, even though it may be cameo, she makes the most out of them. You don't have to be the lead to have one of the most poignant characters in the whole film. If I learned anything from Brink, it's that less is more, and as long as you believe in what's going on inside your head, you don't have to try that hard on the outside. Hello, Marilyn. Holy shit, Rhonda Cooper. Good to see you too, sister. You look awful. What happened to you? I grew up. Other actors should strive to be that graceful with it. Ah, that was hard to do! 
You play characters or situations where there's no template for having done this, for being possessed by an evil spirit, for turning into a vampire, for being hunted by a killer, or turning into a homicidal maniac. Where have you had that kind of life experience? You haven't. So you have to just kind of wing it. Getting into acting through the world of comic books and superheroes, that was her orientation to this. I don't think she wanted to do Macbeth. I think she wanted to do scary movie things. She loved that stuff. Every time she tells me she's doing a new movie, I say, oh, do you kill or are you killed? And she sometimes says both. And then she'll tell me that she's going to, you know, she's, oh, it's a great part. I, I stick this dynamite in a fellow and I light it and then he blows up and then I take his wife and dangle her out the window. She's been shot, she's been stabbed, she's been run over, she's had her limbs pulled apart by aliens, she's been poisoned, she's, you know, arrows, you name it, that's how she's been killed. And when she ran out of ways of dying, then she got on the other side of it, and now, you know, she kills people. Beat me, killed me, yeah, she did on the above. I never killed her, I never did. Damn it, I have to make up for that. Once I 